Welcome to the Breakpoint Recap Show, the podcast dedicated to analyzing the tennis Netflix docuseries Breakpoint episode by episode, and the only one that we are aware of that does that. I'm Gil Gross, joined as always by my friend Alex Gruskin. Season two, we got the episodes early this time. We were officially insiders. We've graduated. <laughs> we've gone official. We've sold out. And uh, as a result, we're going to be much happier as we cover the Australian Open. Uh, and, and we're not having to watch all of these episodes in record speed. I'm happy that you worked that humble brag into the first 20 seconds of this show. Yes, that absolutely helps us from a recording standpoint. Hopefully, it will help you listeners as we'll be able to be a little bit more steady in our release schedule. But more than anything, I'm just thrilled that this was renewed for a second season, that we get the chance to come back together to do this. And again, right away, whether it was the trailer off the bat to see some of the new characters they would be covering We'll get into episode one here on today's show. It was a strong start to season two. That's right. Season two, episode one, The Curse. We're going to talk about it, but obviously since we we haven't discussed the show in, in a bit, let's uh, kind of give a 100,000-foot uh, view and, and refresh ourselves on where we were at when we left off after season one. And uh, I want to start by talking about something that you just said about, I'm glad it was renewed. I saw that, like I saw some people saying that. We kind of agreed that the it didn't feel like this massive F1 drive to survive like success, season one. And since then, the viewership has come out and sure enough, far under drive to survive, to be expected, drive to survive is, you know, a couple of seasons in and this was just starting out. But it also got less viewership by a lot compared to the golf What's it? Swing, swing into it's full swing or full something. Swing. Yeah, yeah. It got it got less viewership than that as well. Uh, here's the thing, though. I don't think it was ever a possibility that season two wasn't going to happen because before the season one episodes, especially the second batch, was even released, they would have needed to be well into producing season two already. Yeah, that checks out from a production standpoint. I defer to you on those sorts of things. In case you're new to this show, we'll trust Gil's <laughs> insider knowledge on how scheduling would work. But obviously, if you or when you have watched episode one, you realize they start episode one at the 2023 Australian Open. And within that episode, they are showing the premiere, dare I say, of Breakpoint on Netflix and the players getting to walk the red carpet and glamming up and the debut in the theater. And so, yeah, they're was obviously the assumption that they would be renewed for a season two. Uh, obviously, they're not going to stick with all the same characters, which I kind of like in particular from a tennis standpoint, as opposed to an F1. You know, you can't just show the same 12 teams or 10 teams, whatever it may be each and every year, because the biggest characters within the sport change. And I love how open they were to that change right away. Yes, you do see some overlap, but you know, again, we're I've already watched the first two episodes and, you know, right away we're starting to get some new storylines, which I think are going to be even more enjoyable and dare I say even more relatable for fans more broadly out there. I think that was an approach they may be a reflection from season one and something we'll get into, I'm sure, through all these episodes. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, we knew we were also going to get kind of a, a different version of the breakpoint show for season two for uh for no reason if not we knew that there were different people running the show uh which is you know we talked to the showrunner of season one who actually came into that season a little bit late uh carrie leah sim and learned in that interview that she wasn't doing season two and it was about timing and kind of uh, everybody's schedule and stuff. So there was going to be a new person in charge. And also that person was going to have the benefit of looking at season one, figuring out what worked and what didn't and making those adjustments. So would you say right off the bat, and we can go over some of the adjustments that maybe we, we wanted to see after season one, but after watching the first two episodes and we're in the same place right now, I've also only watched the first two episodes um, as we speak right now. Do you feel like those who maybe didn't enjoy season one might have some some new stuff to kind of chew on and and might have a new outlook with the way season two is to me it's not it, it's not really a copy and paste they they're doing things a little bit differently 
it's going to be tough to judge all of season two within the framework of the first two episodes because the oh, the climax scenes that kind of punctuate the storylines they're trying to tell are just so monumental and spoiler alert but i guess these things already happened in the year so they're not a spoiler to in that sense uh sabalenka wins the australian open Alcaraz beats djokovic in the wimbledon final kind of putting the crown on this narrative of episode two that there's these young guns on the ascent and those are thrilling storylines to follow i also think the commitment and dare i say the obsession people like sabalenka and holger runa who are the focus of the first two episodes that obsession that they have that's kind of what You fantasize as a sport fan that if I was this professional athlete, that's how I would treat it. And you get these two shining examples of exactly that in the first two episodes. And I think in that sense, it's extraordinarily relatable. They're not telling personal stories. They're telling the stories of this athlete on the rise. And yes, there's some personal background, obviously, littered within the context of trying to tell that story. But it's more about athletes on the ascent. And I think that's what fans who maybe didn't like season one were looking for more than the personal depth that was reflected in some of the episodes. You know, again, you got a lot about Jabur's background. You got a lot about Maria Sakari's background. And I don't say that in a negative sense, but that was something they chose to focus on in telling those stories, these unique backgrounds all these players have and again that's what makes this sport so special no two players are the same but i felt like it was more athlete centric these first two episodes if that makes sense i thought the big adjustment was these episodes aren't about tournaments anymore yeah sure like episode one was kind of about sabalenka yes it worked we start the year australian open but i don't think that was a netflix episode about the australian open where I, I do think, yes, there were obviously like main character focuses of in season one, but remember like they did one episode yeah. and it was like, this is the Madrid episode. And we yeah. were kind of like, why did Madrid get an episode? Now, obviously there are some obvious choices like when, okay, we're gonna do the Wimbledon episode, we're gonna do the US Open episode. And I think both of those actually got two, but like episode two of this season, which we're not gonna get, in depth on 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 this episode that'll be the next show uh it's called the future is yours like that was kind of a that was a whole garuna episode that was not you can't attach that yeah. to a tournament so that that's a different thing look is it a completely different show than it was season one no but i do think they've actually made some like major adjustments to how they're going to go about it that's such an astute observation. I just wanted you to know your Syracuse is showing right now. The people <laughs> at Miguel, they're really proud of that observation by you because you're absolutely right. And again, I don't want to step on the episode two recap, but they literally to the timeline said, hey, fuck it. Like, we don't care the order of events. Like, yeah, you saw him warming up for Indian Wells in the stand match. And yeah, some cool things kind of happened at Monte Carlo for Holger. But we're just going to get you right to Rome where he beat Djokovic. And let's just go from there, by the way. He's going to play Alcaraz in the Wimbledon quarterfinal. That was another cool thing that happened for Holger during this six-month stretch. You're absolutely right. They chased the player, not the event. They didn't spend time. Like, we didn't get the background of Indian Wells. It's the fifth Grand Slam. We didn't get, hey, this, you know, I think at some point they mentioned Rome 16 of 18 times had been won by Djokovic or Nadal. And that's like a fun stat. But that's just him walking through a hallway. They didn't spend a five-minute interlude on it. It was absolutely – Sabalenka wasn't about her having success at this historic Australian Open. It was, no, Sabalenka is having success in the context of this slam title is what she has been chasing and so close to for so long. And so, absolutely, it was much more player-centric than here's what happened at this event and here's the timeline of the season. And – Again, we have to get to episodes four, five, six. Maybe they do a timeline episode where it's like, by the way, here's the more broad arc of the 2023 season. That might be cool in the context of here's what we did beforehand. But yeah, you're you're absolutely right. Okay. Season two, episode one, The Curse. Let's start with the title. Did you know, because look, it's been a while, okay? And <laughs> now, now that... I've watched the episode and I've been refreshed by what we were talking about in January. It's like, oh, okay, I get it. But at first I was like, what's the curse? Did you have that or did you immediately know what it was? I didn't 
think to look into that title because unlike you, I'm not going to obsess over that. I'll let it play out and see, okay, how are they going to work that in? It was pretty clear, though, within the first five minutes when Prakash Amritaj, who works at Tennis Channel, for those that don't know, who you get to see a lot of if you're familiar with Tennis Channel programming, the moment he goes, but then you look at that Australian Open result for these players and immediately you put two and two together given what our positions were. You're like, oh, yeah, there was that Netflix curse moment. I think you guys can hear in my tone of voice the direction my thoughts on that arc of this episode went, but it was fascinating. Like, it was cute. It was uh, funny. I get what they were trying to do. Okay, I, I, I thought it was awesome. So we're going to argue about this. Okay. Let's, start, let's start this off the right way. Uh, first of all, there is this big opening montage. One of the things we actually really liked all throughout season one was some of the montages that they put together where tennis just looked cool and beautiful and and fun and electric. And, you know, in this montage, you have Jessica Pagula talking to the Buffalo Bills. Which Girls I just, swooning over Berrettini. Like, yeah. Again, they're all glittered up for the premiere event as well. That was pretty cool. Djokovic saying... Well, that's the next segment. But Djokovic mm -hmm. saying it ain't happening. Uh, there was some spiciness other than racket smashing. Like they put in some sound bites where it seemed like there was some tension. And, How about uh, the Djokovic booty shake in the exhibition? That was hilarious. Was that? That's, but that was curious. was that that wasn't in the montage. Um. Yeah, I guess that wasn't a mon. I consider that all like the opening arc of here's the. Anyways, you're right. No, but but you're you're right. Okay, after this montage we go to this breakpoint screening, which is something that I do remember seeing where it's like, okay, Netflix had the players all come together and, and watch. I, I don't know how much of it they watched, but you know, the uh, Netflix did an event with the players where they just like in a room, all five, yeah. let's go. <laughs> no bathroom breaks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no popcorn, no pissing. Uh, <laughs> so that's where we start with that, which I thought was funny because it's like, oh, we're being very like, self-reflexive we're being almost self-conscious and then you have prakash as you said come in and literally just directly address the netflix curse uh and i'm it, it was just a moment for me that i was just like oh okay the documentary or the docu-series is acknowledging the docu-series and i liked it why didn't you like it all right I want to preface this by saying, and you mentioned this in the first 30 seconds, boy, are we blessed to be able to watch these episodes early. It really helps us from a release schedule, and it honestly feels pretty cool to know that at least our show was recognized to the point that we are eligible for these early screenings, and I'm immensely grateful for that fact. It was some self-aggrandizing bullshit. Like, <laughs> what are you talking about? It was ridiculous. It's just, did I like, I love the movie premiere. I thought that was really cool to say, hey, here's what these players experienced. And I didn't even hate Courier addressing, who's a great addition to the show, and Osaka's addition to this. I really liked Kyrgios as using players as analysts, uh, you know, current players of their peers in the show. I've really enjoyed that. There's a lot of things I enjoyed. But, like, to say that people care, like, this was a real storyline that was emerging, and to hear all of these voices kind of confirm it and to show these faces, like, is this a conspiracy? Here's on TikTok reason number 3A.4 of why it might be. Like, shut the fuck up. Like, alright, let's go through all these players individually, their circumstances entering that Australian Open. And like, I love it. Mounting injuries and all these different things. Again, it was cute, but like, I, and I love you, Prakash. And by the way, if anyone's going to deliver this line, it should be Prakash, Am Prakash Amritaj, who will always play to the theater of the moment, and that's what he did so beautifully. But but then you saw these players' results, and I was like, oh, my God. Like, come on, separate. That's why Maria Sakri being like, this is, what are you, a Netflix curse? That, uh, I was team Maria there, where you're just like, I couldn't agree more. What are you talking about? Um, I like, Again, cute. And the way that it was all clearly a setup for Sabalenka to close the deal at the end, I loved how she put the bow on it. But I'm going to say it again. Talk about some self-aggrandizing bullshit. Like, come on. I could have done without the TikToks. Yeah. The TikToks yeah. I didn't need. But the fact that Prakash said, I'm not sure if people are going to want to do it, 
which Prakash, and I like that you said that he's playing up to the moment because Prakash knows that the players are going to do it. But I've just never, I don't think I've ever seen a documentary begin with, we don't know if people are going to want to do the doc. People might not want to <laughs> do the doc. <laughs> Let's start with that. I, I just thought that was something edgy and different and unexpected. And that's what I appreciated about it. But we can move on. Um, I, I also appreciate uh, it only works though because Sabalenka wins the event. Like I know, spoiler, but that's the only yeah. reason why it worked. Because at the end, she said, "I think what fuck the Netflix curse or something." She goes, like "No, that. she goes, she goes, what fucking Netflix curse?" Yeah, 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 that's what it is. And like that's why the whole bit works because it's a setup for that. Yeah. But if they hadn't had that, and that was like that was the redeeming moment where I was like, "All right, I get like." I, I kind of knew it was heading there, so that's why I could tolerate it throughout. But it was like, all right, like, come on. Like, it's just if you didn't watch season one and you see this show like addressing itself in that fashion, I'd be like, I don't I don't know how I feel about this. By the way, one of the things that they were also using to build up the Netflix curse storyline were uh, were tweets or uh, X posts, and they did not. They did not fix our complaint from season one. <laughs> of, the tweets are still, it. no, yeah. they're still anonymous. Yeah, like they're yeah. not showing who tweeted it, which yeah. means theoretically they could be completely made up tweets. And I've never seen this in all of my life watching television. I've never seen the blurring out of the profile picture and the username when you're going to show tweets in a documentary. Just tell like just show the account it, it's fine like legally it's okay i'm almost positive for that about that anyway you're right but again we've both been around tennis twitter tennis x for a while and you sniff around you're like these sound about right i i guess so i would uh none of them were mine i know that because i don't I, I didn't tweet about the netflix curse I don't i'm think. pretty but, sure i'm sad they didn't because they played some clips I wish they would have done. It was probably like day four mini break podcast, and I mean, I'm assuming yeah. they listened to all of them in preparation to know the narrative of the show. Um, but they could have heard me say like, "Man, fuck this Netflix curse," and that would have just been a fun like counter to have. In there. <laughs> or if I, they I, needed it after the fact, I would have provided it. I talked about it in a mailbag as well, and my argument was most of these aren't that surprising. Okay, so one, we, we are kind of on the same page there. Step one, we get the trailers. Step two. They include those clips. Yes. Uh, okay. We start with Nick Kyrgios. Again, season, obviously the entire sh show started with Nick Kyrgios in uh, episode one, season one. We go back with Horace and Nick and, uh, you know, they play a little exhibition. It was kind of fun to live in this alternate reality for a second with Nick getting set to play last year because you and I know that Nick Kyrgios was a total and complete non-factor in last year's tennis season. So to, to get started, here we go, 2023, Nick Kyrgios, Australian Open, coming off the, the Wimbledon final that he never shuts up about. Uh, not all love, but you know, it's true. Uh, and then it's, you know, the, the knee injury and he has a press conference and he's not playing. What did you think of, because that was kind of a, another curveball for me, that it starts with Nick, and it's almost like a false intro. So here's what I loved. And this is where I'm going to pivot. Did I like the broader narrative arc of the Netflix curse? I did not. Did I like how they worked in? By the way, if you watch season one, here's an update on all these characters. Nick Kyrgios is playing Djokovic, who's shaking his booty in an exhibition and has just raised $250,000 for charity in 58, not 48, 58 minutes. And... I thought that was going to get a laugh out of you. Unfortunately, he was drinking water instead, folks. That's what it's like to do this show with Gil. Um, anyways, um, and like life is so good. You're right. And he seems happy, which just, again, if you followed the Nick Kyrio story arc from season one, that's something he's been searching for for so long. And it's ruined by an injury. Isla Tamjanovic out not just for Australia, out for three months. Bedos is out. Berrettini loses to Murray early in, you know, the kind of address he'd been plagued by injuries over the course of the past few months there. Like, I enjoyed the Casparu uh, loses early. Felix gets knocked out by a guy named Yuri Lachechka. Love that he got a little shout in episode one. I love this, this opening sequence of here's our check-in 
on all these players from season one. Thankfully, they had Sabalenka as well to kind of wrap that narrative arc. But I really liked that tie into the first season. I thought they did really well there. Yeah, that that was good. I mean, if you are someone, look, there's a lot of people who watch Drive to Survive and don't keep up with F1. A ton of people. So I, I do think you need to somewhat keep that audience in mind. And if Nick Kyrgios just falls off the face of the earth, and then it's like, wait, does he still play? What happened there? Uh, I, I do think it's good to like just cover your bases and address that. And then I think what we'll end up talking about is like Kyrgios is still kind of a big part of this show, even though he's not playing fascinating at all. Isn't it interesting? Um, so it's the false Nick intro, which gives us kind of, I, I could have, I could have used a little more information behind the scenes on Nick's knee. We didn't get that. I, I still don't really know what happened with Nick's knee. I don't think anybody does. Like he hasn't been very forthcoming about the details of the issue with his knee. Uh, but you know, that's okay. He said there was a lump on the side. That's about, that's about what we got. Uh, but then we go to Arena Sabalenka. Of all the ways to start, something not on my bingo card was the opening sequence of Let's Intro Arena Sabalenka. Was that a Florida Panthers game? <laughs> well, that's where we got maybe our quote of the episode where she goes, please let them fight in front of me. I want to see it. Like, talk about Arena Sabalenka in a nutshell. And obviously you learn more that her father was a – a former hockey player and you know that tie-in but you know that physicality that wanting to be in a street fight wanting to throw the big punch that kind of defines her game and defines her personality and she was just such an unequivocal superstar my first or my takeaway coming out of the episode was man you could just do a full season with Sabalenka like just keep the camera on her and obviously knowing what we know about 2023 that would have been a really fun full season on Arena Sabalenka because she has so many different highlights but yeah I mean she starts out again her getting cocky about designing really impressive shoes and then her wanting to see a fight like she is who you think she is and I just think that authenticity it makes her a fantastic follow in this episode yeah, she's a pretty infectious personality. I mean, yeah. I, I just love that she can barely say anything without laughing, yeah. uh, which is my experience with her too. Like I gave an interview, I did 100%. an interview with her at the US Open and it, like it's it's really easy to make her laugh in the best possible way. Uh, and she, she'll also make herself laugh. It's not always to the credit of the people with her. Uh, she just has a great energy all the time, which yeah, inherently makes this... Uh, all more enjoyable in terms of this uh, this episode. So just to add on to that quickly, and I apologize for interrupting you it's here, okay. but why she's such an enjoyable character and what I think makes her so infectious, and I think this tells us something. Maybe these are the sorts of people we need to follow. You just want to be a part of her team, right? Like after watching this episode, it just feels like it would be so fun to be along for that ride for all of the different aspects of it. And – like, I, I don't want to say you didn't feel that about any character in season one, but you feel that particularly about Arena Sabalenka. She definitely falls under the category of, I feel like somebody could watch this and be like, whoa, I love yeah. Sabalenka. I'm totally in on Sabalenka. Go full Dave Portnoy and just become <laughs> like this massive Sabalenka person. Uh, you could definitely see that. And speaking of her team, Jason Stacy ended up, taking a large role. So like the tennis storyline is arena is trying to win a slam. And I, I guess another kind of interesting layer to that was, it seems like she kind of told her father or her father told her, you're going to get one before you're 25 years old. Right. And this was her last major before turning 25. And she was coming off of a, a somewhat difficult season um, as well. So that's the tennis side. And then they start to kind of also talk about some adjustments. Remember also at the end of season one, they kind of got into the double faulting and getting over that mental hurdle stuff. So, so that stuff was kind of already covered, but they go to Jason Stacy, who's Sabalenka's performance coach. And it's kind of interesting because if you were to kind of say who in Sabalenka's team, who's the face of Sabalenka's team, it's Anton Dubrov, who is her coach and it's been her coach for a long time and it was a storyline last year when she was struggling like or it was a storyline last year when she started to have success 
oh, wow, she, she never fired her coach. Like she stuck with this guy even when she was hitting rock bottom and couldn't make a second serve. But Dubrov was not really in this episode. And it was this guy, Jason Stacy, who, you know, was talking about practicing off-site as much as possible. And in so many of these breakpoint episodes, we've seen somebody in the team be highlighted in a way that kind of brings, sheds new light on the life of a player and, and what's kind of going on behind the scenes. And uh, that was this guy. Like there was this great moment where uh, he kind of has to get the physiotherapist to like chill out because Sabalenka wins the semifinal in, in Australia. And the physiotherapist said something like, oh my God, I, I hope I can sleep tonight. And Jason was like, dude, relax. Like we don't want her to hear this, this shit. So I loved Jason in this episode. And it was another example of, of when this, when this show really, really works. You're absolutely right. And it's not just that you love him. It's that you hate him as well. It's that yeah. you just, you know, that guy, that person who you make an offhand comment that you're not really serious about, but he's always turned on. It's like, dude, you can't say that in front of her. And Again, that would be one of the moments. I know I have a friend who would do exactly that thing in that scenario. and be like, dude, shut the fuck up. Like, don't ever talk to me like that. Like, come on. Obviously, I'm not serious. You know I'm not going to sleep no matter what. Like, this conversation doesn't mean anything. But that degree of seriousness, to your point, that extra detail of let's practice off-site and avoid these distractions. Because you have – and they, I credit to the episode, by the way, that shows you. 2021 U.S. Open semifinals, 2022 U.S. Open semifinals, yep. all these different moments where Sabalenka has fallen short before and how this was her singular focus. Again, you mentioned she's in pursuit of a major. I know you know this, but just the key detail, the pursuit of her first major singles title. And she had done just about everything else that tennis had offered up to that point in the 2023, uh, up to that 2023 Australian Open. And Again, to just see the degree to which she went, that singular obsession you have to have to ultimately be there at the finish line. This episode captured that beautifully. You got to see the both the, the ups of the joys of getting to the experience, that, but also, again, the hardship and the struggles as well. And her opening up about her relationship with her father, not just her relationship with her father there, but how her relationship and her father's passing impacted her relationship with her mother as well. And it was just... It was really powerful. You got to see every aspect of Arena Sabalenka. And again, it just it, ref it reflected so positively upon her. Like, yeah. She is just who I want to hang out with now. It was a really kind of beautiful thing after she won. It was probably the most upliftingly emotional moment I think yeah. we've had in the series. Uh, we did talk about in season one when Nick kind of opened up about the mental health that it was kind of the realest and the rawest uh, kind of moment. This was in a different way because it was it was triumphant, but I, I also think in a similar way, it was very real and it kind of got to the core of, of human emotion in the end, which like, honestly, not all of these amazing triumphs uh, have done that in the show. Like even when they show you winning a major and they have – the dramatic music playing and there's tears and there's hugging with the teams. I think this is probably, and I don't know, like maybe it's short term memory because I watched season one, you know, six months ago, but it did feel like the, the time where you were most moved by that moment based on the things that we didn't know when we were watching Sabalenka win the Australian open live. You know what I mean? Yeah, like how, absolutely. how, how good was on the phone with the mom in the end, in no. the locker room? How good was that? You almost tear up when, again, she's talking and she says, hey, I'm on camera, so you know, don't cry. Don't make me cry. And by the way, that's it's so relatable. Like Everyone's had a moment in that, hopefully, in their athletic career, something like that, where you're like, Mom, like I feel as good as you do right now. I get it. Like Let's relax. And obviously, how can she not talk about her father, who meant so much to her athletic career to that point? And you know, Sabalenka says, hey, if you talk about dad, I'm going to cry. So please don't talk about dad. And obviously she's crying through as she says it, but it's tears of joy. And yeah, you're like, you can't help but tear up a little bit and just get emotional at that moment. It's just such, it's such positivity at its finest. Again, when you're so happy, it moves you to tears. You get to see that raw and unfiltered after for Arena Sabalenka, what it means to 
get to the top of the mountain. And again, all these different hurdles. You know, it starts the episode with her saying she's 24 years old, laying out the I want to win before I'm 25, talking about some of the young up and coming players and her saying, I feel old. And it's like, hey, you're 24. Like She is the oldest 24 year old, her and Alex Demonauer, we have in the world because they've been on tour for six full years now. But, you know, again, that she felt that her window was almost closing to have a first moment like this and she gets to capture it so early and gets to overcome that before I'm 25 hurdle. Like it, it was a beautiful moment. It really was so from start to finish, it was a beautiful narrative arc. Yeah. And they explained decently well what the issues were in the past that kind of held her back from getting there. Uh, we saw some of the adjustments that she made at the start of this year, especially mentally and Again, it seemed like Jason Stacy was kind of a, a big voice on the psychological side. Uh, so that was all good. Uh, we will wrap up kind of our thoughts on on Sabalenka in a moment, but I do want to go backwards uh, before we just like kind of give our yeah. big picture thoughts. By the way, I never asked you, would you punch Jason Stacy in the face if he said that to you? Not actually, but metaphorically with your eyes, you'd be like, come on, dude. Like, I know you'd be like, okay, I got it. Like there yeah, was the he's follow right. up explanation. No, I get it. It was the follow up explanation. It was that I would say, you know what? That's a good point. I'll stop saying it. It's if he kept going, I'd be like, dude, I get it. <laughs> like, no, no, no. When you said the first time you don't want to mess with her, I, I got it then. Fair enough. But it's also like, think about if you're, if you're the physiotherapist, right? Yeah. You're like my job is to know how she needs to stretch and how she needs to warm up and how she needs to cool down and how she needs to work out, right? Mm -hmm. So I just loved the fact that like he has these kind of emotions and he's operating a certain way. And then the performance coach, who again, seemed to be pretty focused on the psychological side, was just like, hey, stretching guy, let's, let's not do it and let's get it together here. Uh, let's go back though. Not I, all I, heroes. Some, I get what some you mean. heroes still have to be the villain. I, I Again, 100%. you want her on the team, but I'd be like, oh. It's yes. Oh, right. God. No, he's definitely the bad cop. Yeah, he's yeah. totally the bad cop. Yeah. Uh, okay. Berrettini loses to Murray. You mentioned it for, for a moment. Uh, we talked kind of about the tennis aspect last season and how there wasn't a lot of real tennis. This would have been – it was so easy to give what happened there more meaning. Like the guy had the easiest backhand passing shot you could ask for on match point. <laughs> and he put it in the middle of the net. Okay. It was, how about this take Gruskin? It was in the top three most memorable points of the season. Berrettini putting the backhand pass in the net. Fair or foul? Top three most memorable points of the entire season. I mean, I just watched four week one tournaments unfold in 2024, and I couldn't tell you three points from them. So you're asking the wrong guy because it's tennis overload in my brain, and I flush things like that. Now that you bring it up, I remember it. Um, but that's the point. Yeah. I, I, I mean, cannot. I cannot. Do you remember? Can I bring up points from uh, Wimbledon? Like, no, how, I remember I, matches. Like, here's the thing. I remember right. that match. Like, I do remember, again, it being striking that Berrettini lost that match, particularly having match point. And, of course, it kind of set the tone for what was ultimately a very disappointing 2023, certainly by his standards. A lot of it injury-related. But, yeah, it gets back to this show kind of realizes tennis isn't the easiest sport to broadcast in a documentary format like this we'll show you a shot it's one thing i noticed anytime they're showing someone make contact with the ball even if they're showing a point play out they're going to insert a tennis making contact racket with the ball sound effect to make it sound really clean and pop and that was something i picked up on i was like oh gil's gonna think i'm smart for noticing this um and not really like, considering i and i noticed it last season but yeah but i, I appreciate that i yeah. i'm glad you but, finally got but there you assumed i was smart enough to notice it and i <laughs> didn't um, or at least it didn't focus on it anyways i just yeah like if you're they don't show as much tennis as i would like like i would just watch if it's a match point show me the full match point take the time to do it because match points matter and They'll show you angles. They'll show you players. They won't show you a full point unfold. That continues to be a choice they make. 
I, I don't need a ton of tennis. It's just this stood out to me as like you're taking time to cover the fact that Berrettini lost to Murray. So you've made that decision, and we're going to completely ignore the fact that Berrettini had a simple and easy backhand pass on match point and put it in the middle of the net. And that's why he lost. I just think it would have been a very easy thing, would have been very easy to give that more meaning, that that moment more meaning. But it also signals, okay, we are not going to focus on the minutia of any match ever. Because if there is one, if there is one layup, which is the easiest thing in the world, it's the guy missed an easy uh, shot on match point and then lost. Yeah, but that gets back to something you said earlier. Australia wasn't the storyline. Sabalenka and the Netflix curse was the storyline. And Berrettini missing on a match point honestly could have been used to amplify the curse that they, oh, look how close he even has match point. But because of this Netflix curse, ooh. That's what I'm saying. This is an easy backhand. Yeah, that might be a missed opportunity. Again, I agreed with you the whole time. I don't know how else to say it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's fine. Okay, good. Uh, Next moment, I don't want to pass on. How about Maria Sakari getting pissed at Tom Hill for saying Zhu Lin has a great forehand? Oh, that but that was fantastic. I'm that was yeah, that was I'm glad you bring that up. But yeah, I'm playing Serena 2.0. It's just a that's just a good line. Like if you haven't had a sarcastic moment like that with your coach at least once when you're like, all right, relax, we're not playing Serena. Uh, but I then like that. Shout out to Netflix again. This is a really good piece of work that they go from that to Julian hitting a forehand winner on her and her looking up at Tom and saying, ooh, maybe this girl can play. Um, I get what she was saying. I'm sure then on that serve that whomever her serving partner was hit a bomb and she's like, all right, like I want to hit some returns, please. You don't need to be hitting it 128 at me. This isn't Serena. I'm playing. But that was wonderful. That's how te- that that's how players talk. Like that's that's what it sounds like on a tennis court, folks. Yeah. And then Tom was like, "How would you like me to tell you this then?" Yeah. Because that's... look, like at the end of the day, like you can't watch that and not be on team Tom Hill. Like all yeah, he said was right. she's just got a good forehand. Like that's all he said. You also understand <laughs> so far. You know, M- Maria was basically like, "Stop scaring me." Uh, yeah. anyway, I I I loved that. Uh that was great. I got a this, few if you want to hear them, if, oh, unless you want to get back to Sabalenka. One, one more. One, no, one more, and then we'll get to your moments. Uh, I, I do need to push back on you, and this is a common theme that we've had doing the show. Like, y- you tend to like all of these guest appearances that are made. I, I'm sorry. Naomi Osaka comes in and explains <laughs> what a semifinal is. It's just Naomi Osaka. Then it's like, oh, oh Osaka, what, what, what? <laughs> What's the insight coming here? And then she's just like, semifinals are important because if you win, you make the final. And I was like, wow. Okay, here's where you're wrong. And this is going to get into our various playing experiences. And I'm sorry for doing this and trying to equate what I've gone through to what any of these players have gone through. But you may know 2017, you know, before Michigan won a football national championship, which is a great thing. We set the tone with a club tennis national championship in 2017. And I have always said the hardest round in any tournament is the semifinal. The semifinal is where you want to peak and play your best because you're thinking about, oh, I want to get to the final. I just like I want that shot to play out so badly. And you just start to get in your head, and that's where it's most mental. Then once you get to the the final, I would say just fuck it. You know, let the big dog drink. Like just do what you got. You're in the final now. You made it. That's the hard part. The hardest part is actually getting that opportunity. Now you have it, so let's just roll. Like, I totally got what Naomi meant. It's just like the semifinals the last time because a final's a final. Whatever's going to happen, happened, but you made the final. You did your job. Like, you can't, again, that's the hardest part. You feel like the semifinals the last thing you have control over. And that's what she was trying to emphasize. And again, I love that it was a player, you know, her talking about Sabalenka's strengths and someone you're always looking for in a draw because of how powerful she is. I loved having that player peer review element added to the episode but yeah i mean again i see what you're saying but i agree with naomi the hardest part of a tournament is the semi fight like okay UCLA, cool. once we got through them i knew we were winning uh, great but that's not what she said uh so look this is what we i, I mean i'm just clean up back i'm look, translating i've read ben's book have you 
I'm I've read not <laughs> all of it, but I, I have read it. some of it. I've read some <laughs> of it. Um, all right. I think that particular line should have been left on the cutting room floor. Uh, what are your moments? All right. These are kind of silly, but again, some great lines more than anything throughout. Love Jessica Pagula. I think it was her voice at the end saying, you know, in that opening montage, you do need to get really bitchy, ruthless. I was like, yeah. that's just a good line. It's true. That's what you have to do in this sport because it is individual base. Francis got to be ready for the moment, willing to die for it. Like there are some great quotes from the players offered up and I'm glad that they incorporated them. <laughs> the rest of these, again, gets gets kind of funky. Um, the PA announcer calling players to court in Australia. Yeah. What is this? The hunger games. He's like arena Sabalenka, Elena Rabakina, the women's singles final, please report to court. And it was like, are they about to get killed? Like, <laughs> what, what's the, like it just, and then again, they played it again. It's like this guy, he like, he, can we get a little enthusiasm from him? It just, it was a little, that's monotone. not, that's not the PA announcer, you know? No, but I'm saying he's the PA of, calling he's, them to court he's calling them to be sacrificed well i i love that i took notice of that also i i think that's like probably a somewhat scary moment where if you you know if if you're at like i i know at the when i'm in the facility where they keep the juniors at the u.s open and it's chaos like there's so many kids everywhere and it's <laughs> like you you know you, you just hear these names called out uh to court 12 or or something right and it's like, yeah, that's how it's done. Like you have to call players to a desk and then you tell them what court to go to. Uh, yeah, the fact that they still do that for like the women's singles final, like I think they know what court to go to. This is the final. <laughs> the fact that they still, you know, just run through the motions, I thought was kind of uh, fun to hear. I'm just saying, I know you have some video people on the team. If we can find a way to have the guy who says, let the Hunger Games begin that opening scene before they all run from their platforms next to him calling the guys on court, if that's what you want to do in the short, there's your short for this episode because it's something else. Like I'll, I'll let Maggie short. know. Yeah, I think Maggie will agree with me. And if she does, you'll see this as a short, folks. Um, that was one. This is another silly one. I'm just warning you from the start. But they do the interview pre-match of the finals, or they have the TV crew, right, from Australia inside the hall and inside yeah. the gym with the players. And I just want you to know that a line that is always best sent, said in an Australian accent, we're in the inner sanctum. I was like, oh, she's, <laughs> I was like, oh, she's in the inner sanctum. I totally understand. Uh, I was just like, that's a great accent. It was just a wonderful line. I was like, you know who doesn't say inner sanctum? me i was like this is just a wonderful piece of work so i'm glad they included that i got a chuckle and then last but certainly not least you know what the meal of champions is you know what always tastes it's most delicious when you're just buzzed enough that your stomach starts to start growling and you got that little warmth starting to feel over you a good slice of cheese pizza and that's what Arena Sabalenka and the team were eating after winning the Australian Open title. And it just gets back to my overarching theme here, Gil. She is the common man. Like, that is just a winning play. Oh, you won the title. How are we celebrating? Let's get drunk and order pizza. Like, isn't that? I'm exhausted physically. I just want to sit. I want to feel loose. And I want some fucking pizza. Like, that's what 90% of the world, I like to think, thinks about in life. And that's yeah. what she's living. So it was just a perfect footnote and ending to what was, again, a really fun episode. Yeah, it's a great celebratory food. That pizza looked terrible, I, <laughs> I will say. I mean, that that was not a good-looking pizza. I've you know seen good-looking pizza. That was not one of them. That was, you've made some really good observations. That was astute again. That's that's a great. <laughs> I, that's what I'm saying. That's a drunk pizza. That's like just order pizza. Like yeah. just get it here. I want to eat something. Let's do it. Look, I, last thing to blow your mind, because people, uh, most people's minds are blown. I I obviously I grew up you know 30 minutes outside of New York City. A lot of pizza places. I didn't have. I never had Domino's until I got <laughs> to college. Uh, never ever. Had Domino's. I think we've reflected on this before. Like you would eat Little Caesars would make you, you would you would have a violent reaction. There would be, like, no be no reason. There would be no reason. I don't understand why there are Chipotle's open in Los Angeles either. What's the benefit of Chipotle in LA? I get it in New York. I ate it in New York, 
But <laughs> why? Anyway, uh, there's cheaper in, in Indianapolis. Chipotle. That's where I'm going after we record. As you should. As you should. I'm a supporter. It's just it shouldn't be in <laughs> L.A. or San Diego or Arizona, for that matter. I just want uh, I, we've reviewed this before. You're very smart and sound in your takes about tennis. I trust you more about food than I do about tennis. Like if I need to take, I just would be like, if I ever have a food related question versus if, if I have a tennis related question, I'll work it out myself. If I have a food related question, Gil is the first text. It's not even a, like a thought. Thank you. I like this episode. Uh, yeah. I think Sabalenka worked. I don't think there was really a, a dull moment. I thought the Netflix curse theme was was kind of left field in a way that that felt yeah. fun to me. Uh, I thought there was a lot of behind the scenes that were were standout moments, like the Sakari Tom Hill thing, uh, some of the Jason Stacy stuff, and it was also really beautiful with with Sabalenka and the father and the storyline. And it felt felt really really rewarding um, when she ended up winning at the end, even though even though we knew it. Yeah, no, it was a really well done episode, excuse me, even like, again, it was a little tacky. There's no doubt about it, that Netflix curse theme, but as Sabalenka wins the episode, she was the superstar. She is someone who could carry a series like this and for her to finally get, because I know she got mentioned at the end of season one, but again, this set a really strong tone for season two and I this was a winning episode for sure. This has been Breakpoint season two. Episode 1, The Curse, on the Breakpoint Recap Show, Gil Gross YouTube, Crack Rackets Podcast Network.